to the Mountainside Podcast. Our guest for this episode is our first female on the Mountainside Podcast, and we couldn't be more excited that it's Mercedes Siegel Gaither. She is an amazing human being. She has her own nonprofit that helps promote conservation and getting people out in nature and understanding what it's all about. On top of that, she works for the U.S. Forest Service and is a biologist and has spent some time all over the world helping with conservation. Not only is she a badass woman trying to help conserve what we all love, but she is also a high endurance athlete running ultra marathons at the highest level. She also brought her amazing famous dog with her, Java, that hung out with us in the studio the whole time and was also our first dog on the podcast. Great time. I hope you enjoy the listen as much as I enjoyed talking to Mercedes. Mercedes, how are you? Good, how are you, Bobby? I'm excellent. Thank you so much for making the drive up. I yeah. know it was a bit of a trip for you, and um, I'm just super excited to have you, and the reason why is you're our first female on the show, <laughs> and you also brought your dog with you. She's pretty cute. Yeah, she's awesome. We're going to have to hold her up for the camera here yeah. in a minute or something so everybody can see her, a little pity. She's is a she a pit bull? Or? Yeah, she's our little foster fail, and they didn't really know what she was. Uh huh. She's kind of tiny for a pity, but... She's cute. Yeah. She's awesome. But yeah, I'm I'm super excited to have you. And also we're joined by uh, a new co-host today that's also a female because my n- normal guy, Jeremy's out of town. He's in Philadelphia visiting some family or something. So probably like getting something. in trouble. Yeah, yeah. Knowing Jeremy. Need a little more <laughs> estrogen on the <this> show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, we did actually. And it's weird because... Um, I had scheduled a couple of females like prior to this, like I kind of knew like on the third episode, I was like, okay, well, I started this, I should say this, I started it pre COVID-19, right? So right. I was going to start in 2020. And then when I went through all the red tape, there's a ton of red tape to get your podcast up on like all the different platforms. And it just took a while. And then we needed a website and I wanted it to be all set. So by the time we got all of our shit together, really, <laughs> it was about like the beginning of March and I had a bunch of people schedule and I was like, oh, it'll be perfect. I'll schedule it for like middle of March. Perfect. Boom. For COVID. Right. <laughs> yeah. Here comes COVID. Right. And um, so, yeah, the third episode, I think we had scheduled a professional mountain biker that was a female and I was like, oh, this is going to be perfect. Oh, sweet. And basically all of our guests just dropped off in the first 12 episodes that I had scheduled just gone because that's just the dog drinking in the background it's not me (laughs) (laughs) it's so awesome to have a dog in here normally i've thought about bringing mine in because she's really good and just sleeps by my feet all the time but uh but yeah so anyways we were we were scheduled to have like 12 different episodes with all these heavy hitters and then it just started dropping off left and right and we just kind of had to ad lib but it's actually some things have worked out better i think like I think the show's almost turned into something that it may not have been if it wasn't for COVID-19. And I've got to meet some really cool people. And, uh, like, I was able to run across to you and have you on that yeah, I'm for happy an episode. About it. Yeah. <laughs> so it'll be really awesome. Uh, and I can't wait to learn all about you. You're definitely an interesting person and have an extensive <laughs> background in a lot of different things. And we're going to try to hit all of them in an hour and a half, but I don't know that it'll happen, you know? We'll see what happens. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so what have you been doing currently, just current life with COVID-19? I don't know how much that really has affected you as an ultra marathon runner. And right. um, I guess I should say that first, that you compete in those and you're also a biologist, right? And yeah. you work in forestry. You do a lot of different stuff and <laughs> we're going to get eclectic and more and more and more it goes on and on right <laughs> yeah i mean COVID hasn't been too bad it's been letting me telework which works out really well with running because you can just go to work in your running clothes take a running break yeah so that's been good but i mean when you're out on the trails you're alone anyways so not much has changed there and then being out in southwest Colorado, there's not that many people compared to out here in Denver. There's just the trails are packed. So haven't been having those issues so much. Um, but other than that, you know, I work in the forest anyways. So, right. you know, 
things aren't too different, but yeah, I, I, it's crazy. I can't believe the influx in people since COVID nineteen, just in this general area of Jefferson County. I mean, you saw it today, just trying to come into Evergreen. It's just like oh, uh, people have so much free time on their hands, yeah. right? And that you live in Colorado, and you want to get out and enjoy it. So the trails have just been getting hammered for yeah, sure. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. There's probably especially gonna be, around here. There's gonna be so much competition next year with all these new trail runners. I'm sure. Oh yeah, <laughs> I didn't really think about that because people have, like, there's some people that are getting in shape. Like some friends of mine that have dropped like 40 pounds and are just shredded. I feel like I'm going the opposite way a little bit, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I still try to get out and get my miles in. That's good. That's yeah. awesome. I was able to get out this morning a little bit. It was nice. Oh cool. It's, I. It's been warm though. It's been so hot. My Colorado is not supposed to be 90 degrees all the time, but it is. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like it is more and more these days, you know, for sure. Um, And you're down in Pagosa Springs? Yeah. Okay. And it still gets so hot there. Like we're about 7,200 feet, but that sun is brutal. So it's kind of forcing me to become a morning person. You have to. That's what, that's when I get up. I'm at like. I try to get up at four every day, but normally Oof. that turns into like five thirty. Oh wow, that's awesome! But if I can be on the trail by like six, it's not that bad. It's nice and cool. That's like perfect. some mornings, I even go out in like a long sleeve shirt, and just as I'm getting back, normally that's shed it off, you know. But right, it's the perfect temperature. And Java loves it. She's getting in shape too, so. So she goes with you on your runs. Or? Yeah, she's a tough little thing, and then we'll get back, and she'll just start sprinting circles like it wasn't enough for her. Right. So. She's keeping me in A lot shape of energy, too. huh? So much. She's just like a 50 pound little ball of muscle. She really is. Yeah. She knows we're talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good girl. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, my little dog's been going with me, but I haven't, <laughs> honestly, I've been using it as an excuse because I ended up talking to a dog trainer. And when I first got her, when she was a puppy, they were like, yeah, you probably shouldn't take her more than maybe like a mile. And I was like, okay, cool. An excuse for me not to run, right? (laughs) Right. And when I say run, it's more of like a soft, soft jog. You know what I mean? I'm a big guy. so. But, uh, but yeah, she's been going with me lately, and it's been awesome. It's great having like a dog with you, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then you're not talking to yourself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You're not this crazy person running down a trail, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and fortunately I found some trails around here where there's nobody at or top secret. But if you're hanging out for a day or something, I can maybe show you the ropes. Yeah, don't say it on here because then people will. No, (laughs) absolutely not. I barely dropped the city name on here, you know. Oh, really? Good thing I didn't say it. (laughs) No, it's all good. It's been blown up left and right. I can tell. Like, uh... Rogan's a big fan of Evergreen. We'll just say oh, it. Really? We'll just get it off the of books because it's going to be haunted. Yeah. So he's dropped it on his podcast, and I think he has like over 10 million listeners oh, no. yeah. per episode or something. We're not even touching that. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> All of his followers are probably out there right now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of out of state plates out there for sure. But cheers to coming in. Oh, I'm yeah. Super cheers. excited to have our first female. And uh, Carla, can you hear me back there? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. We're super excited to have you, too. It's great to have uh, the support that I do. I couldn't do it without these people, for sure. Well, so. Evergreen represent here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Evergreen. <laughs> All right. So uh, can we talk a little bit about ultra marathon running? Because that's something that I'm super intrigued with, because it's something that I would probably never, ever do in my life. <laughs> um I feel like if I run five miles, that's that's a feat for me. That's you good. know what I mean. That's a good amount, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> I uh, mean, just keep going. Yeah, I guess I'm more of I train sport specific, and I'm super into jujitsu, oh, so cool. I try to do strength and conditioning for that. So I jump a lot of rope, and then um, I try to train every year for elk hunting season because oh, uh, nice. I'm an avid elk hunter. So. That involves putting on a 40 pound pack full of water and hiking mountains and, you know, steep as the back of your neck type of thing. So it's kind of a bit of a different workout. Oh, yeah. And then um, if you actually get an elk, you got to get it out. And- yeah. So that's kind of the whole purpose uh, of how I train. But what you do is so different, right? Because you're running like 50K marathons. And uh, it's just, I would consider you a high endurance athlete. I mean, at that point, if you're doing anything like that, like anything over a marathon to me, I think you almost have to be high endurance just to run a regular marathon. 
Yeah, and then normally the marathons are just on cement, so I feel like it takes some whole other kind of mental capability. You're right. just running around cities. So I feel like, you know, in the a- aspect, the trail ultras are kind of nice, like a nice part of a little bit of relief because you're not just staring at cities. But I feel like it is kind of similar to hunting. Like, I'm not a big hunter, but I like shed hunting and I like fishing, which fishing you don't need to run but yeah you know if you're looking for sheds you can cover more ground if you're a runner so it's kind of cool absolutely i yeah. never really thought about that but uh maybe i should start running when i'm shed hunting. <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get a chance to get out and do too much of it this year but uh i've seen uh some of your posts on instagram and i think that that's what carla's looking up right now she found yeah. some incredible photos of you oh, prior man. to us uh sitting down here but look at that. That's awesome. That's a full rack. Yeah, my boyfriend was pretty jealous about that one. Yeah. <laughs> and it I was bet. perfect. It was literally just like, it must have died after winter or something because it was just uh-huh. laying up against this log. And I looked down and it was pretty close to a trail. I'm like, how did no one see this? Right. So I was pretty pumped. I could barely hold it. It was pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. But yeah. Yeah. That, it's, it's fun to find those. And there's guys that actually make a living off of that. And, uh, I don't know. I didn't really look into it too much this year. Like, I went with my son a little bit. But I think that there's – and, Carla, this is something that you may need to look up for us just so we can let our listeners know. I think that Game and Fish has declared, like, a season on it, right? Yeah, I think that happened, like, two or three years ago. Okay. Um, Because it used to just be free reign where you could just go out and, like, find sheds. So so I think now if you find one before the season actually starts, you, can't you can get in it. trouble. It's almost yeah. like poaching or something. I think it's like before May, something like that. Okay. Anything west of 50, you can't touch them. But it's different per state maybe. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I think that that's for any sort of shed, any sort of size. And to me, I guess I don't really understand that, right? Because the longer a shed sits there – the more likely it is to get eaten up by mice and stuff like that, which I guess they need that nutrients too, but kind of defeats the purpose, right? I think it happened relatively close when I was a park ranger. And I think the main initiative is that, you know, when you have shed hunters, you always have the people that go too far and are stressing out the herd. So they're literally Uh, harassing the herds around the time they drop them, trying to get them to drop them. And then, you know, elk are so susceptible to these pressures as it is that they were kind of causing havoc to the herd. So that's why they created it. That makes a lot more sense. I'm glad that you're a biologist and we have (laughs) you on here to explain these things to me. But uh, yeah, that makes a lot more sense because I guess as as a kid, I used to shed hunt all the time, but we were just looking for them on the ground. But actually, I've seen some guys on YouTube and stuff and they're actually like, following elk around like waiting for them to drop so those are the people who made this rule like because of them now we have this rule we can't go Mm -hmm. but i guess it makes sense and then there are some people like i had someone comment on one of my posts it might have been that one or a different one and they're like that's just sick and i'm like do you think I'm chasing elk and like ripping these off their yeah. antlers? She didn't know. <laughs> you think she I literally, scalped them? That's what she thought. And really? she's like, oh, they're in something new every day. Right. So. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, that the hate mail that you'll get off of just something like that. And I think a lot of people, there's got to be a little bit of give and take to that. Like I'm a big meat eater. That's pretty much all that I eat in my diet. And that's the main reason I hunt. I'm not a trophy hunter. Right. Um, You'll never see me posting a big picture of a big rack or anything like that, really. Um, But so I'm solely pretty much doing it for the meat and then also to help with the conservation issue and and to also teach my children on how to basically be a good steward of the land and be a good sportsman and be ethical. And uh, I think there's a lot of value to taking a life sometimes, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it puts it in perspective to... I feel like everybody should experience that once, especially with something that's bigger than them, just so that they can, and I'm not saying that everybody should go out and shoot an animal. I'm not saying that. I think that just being present while that happens, or even if you're at a meat packing plant or something like that, it really puts it in perspective. I mean, that's something that's going to be burned into your brain forever. Right. And then, you know, it's sustainable. Like the deer populations here are so high. If it weren't for hunters, you know, they'd be getting hit by cars and 
even with elk, you know, sometimes the weaker ones aren't going to survive the winter anyways. And I don't think a lot of people realize that bulls fight each other. And sometimes they just, they get these puncture wounds from one another's yeah. antlers. And it's kind of similar if you're a bow hunter, you know, they don't even know what hit them. Yeah, no, I feel like bow hunting. And the one reason why I bow hunt and I don't, I haven't rifle hunted in probably 20 years. Oh, wow. Um, and I just don't have any desire to. And I think it's a little bit of that is the ethics behind it and the cleanness and it's more challenging. And I'm a, I'm a very ethical person. Like if I'm going to take an animal's life, I want it to be quick and painless. I don't, I mean, I've had instances where, and I've witnessed instances where an animal has been grazing, they get shot. They go back to grazing and fall over. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's about the cleanest way that you could go, I would think, at that point. But that's not why I brought you on here was to talk <laughs> about hunting. But I think it's awesome that you go shed hunting <laughs> and that you advocate. Yeah, the sheds yeah. don't run away from me, so yeah. I, can, I can get them. You chase them down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're pretty fast, too. <laughs> but uh, so what's going on with your race schedule now? Are there any races that are still happening? Are you signed up for any for this year? Or what's well, luckily, I snuck one in before COVID. I did this Mad Moose 55K in Moab, which was... Oh, wow. I didn't realize how much rock there is in Moab. <laughs> so that was pretty fun. It was literally just all these petrified dunes and the slick rock. And so it was pretty brutal, but it was awesome. Utah that's was a great. fun experience, but yeah, it's a that's some incredible country. There's, I mean, everything from straight up mountains, but Moab's more like the desert. And yeah, no trees. Like a mecca <laughs> of rock climbing, right? There's a lot of rock climbers that go there. And I think so. Yeah, and jeepers. It was oh actually yeah. Actually, pretty funny because some of the aid stations were ran by jeepers. I don't know. That's what okay. <laughs> they have jeeps, and so the jeepers would literally be like, "Wow, holy shit!" Like. I can't believe you're running this. And then we would be like, holy shit, I can't believe you're driving this. <laughs> so it was kind of fun because I feel like those two recreation groups don't really get together very often. So yeah. it was cool that they were supporting us and we kind of got to talk to them a little bit. It's kind of like sports car drivers and road bikers, right? Yeah. Like they're Ooh. giving each other the finger half the time, yeah. <laughs> right? There's no like common courtesy there. Yeah. But but yeah, that's pretty cool that they implemented four-wheel drive guys to help right? support I don't race, know how they you know? suckered him into that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they took a wrong turn and they're like, oh, perfect. You can work this aid station now. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, some of the questions that I have and I think our listeners would want to know, and uh, if you're an ultra marathon person, I don't mean to bore you, <laughs> but I, I'm going to ask a bunch of stupid questions. Like, obviously, if you're running 50K, how many miles is that? That's So that's like 31-ish. Uh-huh. Um, you're going to be doing it probably starting at dark or after dark, maybe? Yeah, to finish. so I guess it depends what time of year you're doing it. But yeah. that was like a 6 a.m. race start for the 55K. So it was light out. And it was a little chilly, but I don't know. It was like 35 degrees, so it was kind of perfect. Yeah. I know people were complaining it was cold, but no one really wants to run in Moab in the summer when it's really hot out. So. That makes sense, yeah. But it usually depends on the distance. Like the 50-miler I did in September, I think, had a 5 a.m. race start. So you have to start with a headlamp. It's dark out. And then, like, 6.30, I got dewed on. Like, the dew point hit. And I just oh, got yeah. soaking wet. And I'm like, I don't know if this is You got is dude normal. over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that where the doo-doo comes from? Maybe. I, yeah, I okay. But I feel like that probably doesn't happen out west. That was in Wisconsin. So it's oh, a okay. lot more humid. Yeah, we don't have the humidity here no. like they do back east. That's yeah. a big factor when it comes to cold and heat. Oh, for it's sure. huge. Yeah. It's brutal for sure. But, yeah, so, I had been running in Colorado. And I'm like, oh, great. Like, I'm training at... And I was like 5,200 feet, so not that high. I'm like, I'm going to just run so fast when I get back to Wisconsin. And then I just felt like I was drowning because it was so humid. Yeah. So, yeah. That's a big difference. I know that I went and um, have done some hiking and stuff, like all the traveling that I've done. And it's just different. Like, I feel like humidity sometimes plays almost the same effect. If somebody was coming from a sea level spot and maybe going to like 8,000 feet and trying to run, the humidity's kind of got that reverse effect. If you go to sea yeah. level and it's super humid and hot, like a Texas or like, oh, yeah. like Dallas or something like that. Yeah, for sure. It just gets so muggy that it's like hard to breathe. Or at Mississippi, I ran there oh, for a yeah. while and literally I'd run two miles and just be soaking wet and 
so brutal with the heat and all the humidity. <laughs> yeah. Not great. But I think there are some coaches that will train their athletes in humidity, and I think they're kind of looking at the difference between the heat and humidity versus altitude. Sure. So that'll be Because it's almost like with humidity, you're getting boiled. Yeah, literally, <laughs> you know you're just I mean? boiling. Like, yeah. you're just dehydrating every step. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I don't like the feeling of it. I definitely am a, a Colorado native, and and I like that dry weather if it's going to be hot i want it to be dry that's but, super nice but like vegas dry and hot is too hot for me that's like that much. 117 or yeah whatever they get out there is just brutal <laughs> i mean that could be just as bad oh for sure so h- how often are you running at night and what kind of uh like support do you have like um along these trails and stuff as a race progresses like the 50 milers or something like that are you expected to bring your own support team or is it so it depends i'm thinking so for mine i had a pacer and he was awesome he's a runner too obviously so and then i had my mom there who really had no idea what she's doing i love her so much and my best (laughs) friend showed up and same thing like they were just there to help me and then my buddy mikey was there to pace me and thank goodness for him because he brought a knee brace which i ended up having to use but the hard part is Most races, I think, they're only supposed to meet you at certain places. So there's the aid stations that you can rely on. And then it just depends if you bring a pack or not. You can bring your own water. They have the handheld. So it just kind of depends your preference. And then because there are the aid stations, you can rely solely on those for food and different gels, things like that. Or you can just bring them with you. So normally I try to bring some things with me. Um, So what is a gel? Is that like a nutrition Kind of. Thing or try to get some calories while you're running or yeah, something? Yeah. So, okay. you know, as long as you're not eating them while you're not doing some sort of endurance activity, um, shout out to Goo. I'm sponsored by goo. them this year. Yeah, okay. Goo Energy Goo and Labs. Goo. Yeah, yeah, Goo and Goo. <laughs> uh, but so they have different things. They have these Stroop waffles, which are awesome. You just have to make sure not to inhale the crumbs when you're running and choke on them. Oh, yeah. Um, but then they have So is that like, like one of those caramel wafer things yeah. that they give you on the airplane or whatever? <laughs> They're just like yeah. that. Okay. They have different cool. flavors. Um, But then they have, like, the actual goose, which is just, like, sugar. (laughs) But they have the option. You know, you can throw in, like, salts and amino acids and caffeine. Oh, okay. So So they're kind of tailored to whatever your specific nutritional needs might be for that race or for yourself personally. Yeah. And so then just every, you know, half hour, 45 minutes, you can take one just to make sure you're not completing, completely uh, depleting your glycogen stores. So you're still running on something. Okay. And then the other thing I always warn people is try them (laughs) before a race because your body's not used to expending all that energy running. And all of a sudden you throw some food in the mix. You kind of got to get used to being able to eat while you're running still. Sure. But yeah, they're good. It's just like candy. We had another ultra marathon runner on uh, episode. He was actually our second episode and he's a friend of mine. Shout out to Jay Steinberg. Super cool guy. Um, But he was talking about as he trained he would purposely deplete his body in the morning oh, while he really? would go for like these 20 or 30 mile runs training for like 100 milers, right? Oh, cool. And uh, he lives up here at this altitude. So about the same altitude as what you're probably training at a lot. Um, but he would purposely deplete his body so he knew how it would react during those – during a race, right? Like he tried to yeah. make it as realistic as he could to be in, in a race – as far as this training, do you go to that extreme or do you do that um, somewhat a little like prior bit, leading up to a race? Not purposefully generally. Yeah. <laughs> if it does happen, it's usually because like, oh, shoot, like I decided to run further than I originally planned because sometimes I'll just get up and see what feels good and see how far I'll run. Um, but generally I'll run in the morning and so I, I run on an empty stomach anyways, so it's pretty similar so it just yeah. depends. Like if I run 20 miles, I'll probably bring some goo or something like that just in case because no one wants a hangry runner. But <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I've uh, I've gotten to where I started doing the intermittent fasting yeah. a little bit, and I really like it. It took me a couple of weeks to get used to it. But, man, what a world of difference. Like once you get that hangry fuel a little bit, like <laughs> if you're lifting weights or you just feel better, like you feel more – Right, not bad. Agile down. or something. Yeah, it's it's weird, and I no totally notice it. Like when I'm hungry, I'm super hungry, but then after that, I'm like, okay, I'm done. I better have gotten all my workouts in 
prior to eating. It's really strange. Right. Uh, I can see that. I think that's just kind of like my routine now, but that's helped me tremendous. I try to go, I'm just doing the, the pussiest version of it, the 16 <laughs> and eight or whatever. Like yeah. there's some people out there that go like three or four days and go hard. that would not be good for me. I don't think. And it's weird. I've heard it's kind of different for women. Like it's not good for them to fast as long. Oh, okay. I'm not super sure the details. I think it has to do with hormones maybe. That makes, makes sense. sense. <laughs> yeah. And uh, me and Carla were actually talking about that prior to the pot to us sitting down and starting to record the podcast. Um, Carla, what were you telling me about women and uh, their endurance levels when it came to ultra marathon running? You saw a documentary or something? Yeah, I had watched the documentary um, with uh, Nikki Kimball from Vermont, and she she was the first woman to break. Um, well, to, to get a pretty substantial uh, lead on the long trail. And um, the documentary mentioned that uh, in ultra marathon, the curve between um, men and women can kind of flatten out a little bit as far as endurance goes. And I'm not sure the whole science behind it. Uh, do you know anything about that, Mercedes? Hmm. Not exactly, but I know, like, for example, Courtney DeWalter is a badass. She beats all the boys she all the time. She is a badass, yeah. And she's pretty young, I feel like, for the ultra running community. But it seems that as we get older, like maybe in the 40s, men aren't beating us as much. So I have a feeling it has something to do with age, too, and maybe hormones. I'm not super sure, but that would be interesting to find out for sure. Yeah, it would. We'll have to look up some of those facts at some point and yeah. try to figure it out, but... But yeah, she's a, she's an awesome lady. I follow her on Instagram, and just some of the stuff that she does is incredible. I think. Like, yeah, she's a beast. And yeah, she just hammers like nachos and candy. I love it. <laughs> like, what does she really? Feeling? I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. straight awesome. up. That's crazy because uh, I think it was it might have been Kobe Bryant or something. It was some sort of documentary, and they were asking him like, "What do you eat before every basketball game?" He's like. <laughs> mcdonald's number two <laughs> big mac special or whatever you know what i mean i was like Best feel. oh my god i would feel horrible like trying to play a basketball game on a mcdonald's right you know value meal or whatever Just forget about down. it yeah <laughs> <laughs> so uh when it comes to navigation is the trail are the trails really well marked or do you have a gps watch or anything like that that's kind of helping <laughs> so, you along the way as of recently, I got this fancy Garmin, and it has offline maps and trails and topo lines really? on it. It's amazing. Is it one of the solar ones? Because I've been looking into that. That was an extra $100. Oh, so okay. <laughs> I didn't go with the solar option. Sure. But those do exist, and I think they'll just prolong the battery kind of. So okay. if you are running, it'll kind of just stay even. Sure. Um, but it's funny you ask that because I have a tendency of getting lost. <laughs> I think my very first marathon, I took a wrong turn because generally they'll use markers, and I feel like... You know, if you're doing a, a marathon in the city, there's so many people running it that you can't get lost. But when you're out on the trail, you know. Yeah, and they put up, like, bicycle barricades and yeah, all this kind of crazy stuff, right? They make it really right? easy. Yeah. And then when you're out on the trail, you know, eventually you get distance between you and all the other runners. And, like, in Moab, it was all this slick rock. And so it's so hard for them to mark it because it's just rock. Like, you can't stick a flag in the ground. And then people will trample them and they fall down. And You I was, don't want to be spray painting lines yeah. on the rock. Yeah, they're not. <laughs> and so I think it, there was a point where I was alone for a half hour. And I it was, like, late 20s and I'm miles. And I'm just, like am I still like on course? I haven't seen anyone for a long time. Oh, like, should I be concerned? Am I dreaming? <laughs> like, is this even happening? So it depends. It's pretty tough. I feel like for them to mark trails. And then if they have different distances, like a marathon, a 50 K or like a 50 miler, they have to different use different routes. coloring. Yeah. And when you're running, you're literally just putting all your energy into moving forward. Not like, Oh, Am I looking for blue flags or pink flags? Like, when's the last time I saw a marker? So sometimes right. it's a little tough. And you don't want to trust the asshole in front of you, right? He might be going the yeah. wrong way or yeah, she. Yeah, I did or... that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I followed him up, so I ran, like, <laughs> unnecessary elevation. And of course, then it's someone... a man, too, not yeah, asking for directions, right? Yeah. yeah, but luckily someone behind me was, like, whistling. They're like, come back. And I'm like, okay. And the other guy was already gone, and it's, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all part of the fun. <laughs> So, will with your watch, will you map a course before you actually start it so it'll tell you if you're off course? Or mm. have you gotten into it that much? 
I've only had it for like a month, so I'm not sure okay. how to do that yet. Shout out to Garmin too. We need some sponsorship over yeah, here. Garmin's Both of us, awesome. right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could use one in the back country. Right? I've been looking at their solar options. I actually have a uh, just for being out with the family and uh, I call it the false sense of safety, but it really <laughs> is a sense of safety is uh, one of the in reach like oh, yeah. it's this little thing and it's they're super. I think they're inexpensive or not super expensive for what you're getting. I think they're like three hundred dollars and then you have to pay a subscription fee, but it's got an SOS button on it. Right. And uh, I try not to rely on it because I think that that could be a common mistake, too, like. The battery life on the thing is maybe three days if you're barely using it. Um, and I think that – I'm just saying this out loud. I think that anybody that has one of these should learn how to navigate with a compass or use oh, landmarks. Sure. Like that's what I was taught as a kid, right? Yeah. Like you don't want to rely on this little thing. But in a sticky situation, that SOS button is super awesome to have that option oh, for sure. the insurance for rescue and that sort of thing if i highly encourage i think for an additional like two hundred dollars or something you can get an insurance plan that covers you for a certain amount of um medevac or evacuation like if they have to call in a helicopter it gets right. super expensive oh, i can imagine yeah but it's good to have that option for sure. I know this one has like a an incident response. So like if I fall or like smack into something. Really? Or just So stop. like if you hit your head or something, it'll... I think so. Yeah. Or if you just like abruptly stop running because your puppy decided to go a different way. <laughs> it'll do like <laughs> incident report and then you can either cancel it or it'll... Oh, really? But I don't know that it would work if I'm out in the middle of nowhere and it can't connect to my cell phone. I think that's how it would reach out. Oh, Really? So. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that uh, most of those, like most of the Garmin things are solely satellite. Right. And even if it is using your cell phone, like um, what's that? Is it Strava? Yeah. Yeah. The app that tracks like mountain bikers or road bikers, runners. It's an awesome app. Yeah. And their free option is, is totally great. cool. I mean, <laughs> you, you really don't need much more than that. So it's really cool that that's accessible to people. I urge anybody, even if you're just walking a mile. To use that thing, it'll oh, tell you sure. how many calories. It'll show you on a map where you went. It'll keep track of your time. It's pretty incredible for yeah. free. It's an awesome and now, feature. But I've noticed um, a couple times that I've used it, I've been out of cell phone range, and it works off the GPS on the phone. So yeah. I would imagine Garmin's got that technology. I mean, right. they're probably not selling you a $400 watch that doesn't have some sort of satellite oh, $400. connection. Oh, $400. Oh, <laughs> oh, really? Okay. I got a discount. Oh, yeah? Otherwise, no awesome. one yeah. afford it. But Are you sponsored by them? Or? No, I think I'm part of this like Garmin crew. It's one of those oh, sweet. ambassador programs. I don't know oh, really perfect. what it does, but yeah. That's great. Any sort of discount like that helps, I'm sure. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 100%. So. Well, that's awesome. Um, what do you – what's your favorite – type of race to run is it is it an ultra like as far as you can go or 100 milers is it 50 milers is it just a regular marathon or so as of right now because i've done quite a few like 50 to 55k races i'm at the point where i just want to see how far i can go and so like september i did my first 50 miler and then this upcoming september i'm supposed to do my first 100k I don't know what's going to happen with COVID because I'm not running that virtually. <laughs> right. <laughs> this sounds super fun to do it by myself, but. Wait a minute. They're doing virtual ultra marathons now? Yeah. Wow. So you can go run by yourself and you can pay to do it. Or that you doesn't didn't. make a lot of sense to no. me. No. Then you get a medal in the mail. So. Okay. You know, <laughs> if you're just working on your medal collection or something. You're right. You could also get a medal out of a Cracker Jack box as oh. well. I well, think. That's, yeah. whole, that's way easier. <laughs> I'm you, just kidding. You don't have to get off the couch yeah, Not to knock one. anybody that's doing it virtually. I think any way that you can get out and compete during this time yeah. is, you know, my hat's off. And maybe it's not for everybody. Like it's, It depends, like, what kind. Like, I did a vertical elevation ultra, so you had a week to do as much elevation as you could. So it kind of gave me a reason to mix up my training and go, like, find some mountains to try to scramble up. Sure. So that was fun. And I feel like it's – they're trying to kind of keep that sense of running community together. So it's been fun, you know. And what are you doing that through an affiliation or is that if somebody um, wanted to 
if they were interested in participating in something like that, how would they? Yeah, there's just like a ton of groups online. Like that one was with um, Run Steep Get High, and they've been doing a couple different types of virtual runs. Colorado-based company, I'm sure, right? I think it might (laughs) actually be like Utah, Arizona. Oh, okay. But Colorado would make more sense. Yeah, yeah. But um, but it's not a 420 reference then, huh? I don't know. Oh, I have okay. a hat and it has like a sheep on it, and I'm like, oh, this okay. is awesome. Think what you want when I wear this hat. So right, <laughs> yeah. I like to run, so whatever oh, yeah. you want to think. Um, but yeah, I think like Mad Moose is the the run I did in Moab, and I think they were doing some virtual races. But because it's a trail run, you know, and you're so out there by yourself, I think they're finally being allowed to do races again, and they're just kind of limiting the capacity. So. Fingers sure. crossed that my run happens in September. I was wondering, too, because a lot of ultras, they start you guys all at the same time, right? Yeah. And I was kind of thinking that they still might be able to do it. Um, and believe me, I don't know any of the science behind any of this or how that operation works. So I'm totally stepping outside the lines <laughs> here when I'm commenting on this. But it just made a lot more sense to me, like... Um, and I'm going to compare it to truck racing because I've been around <laughs> motorsports a bunch and I've been to the Baja 1000. I, I can't even count how many times because um, I used to work for a company that sponsored that. And that's a whole nother story. But anyways, they start all the racers at individual times. So one truck pulls up at a time and it takes off. And then it's a time thing, whether you pass somebody or not or whatever. But I just thought that that might be a way yeah. to get around it to where they could still do those sort of things and, and keep the same capacity maybe. But I don't know how that would work with the start times and your position and right. so what I time think, of day and all that sort of thing. I think that's actually how they were doing it because I was looking at doing the Bears Ears Ultra like two weekends ago and I ended up not going because we had a friend in town. But I think they just had different corrals. And so they would, you know, pace them like two minutes and then have a bunch of other people start. So instead of having 100 people at the same time, they could break it up into smaller groups. Sure. And so, I mean, at this point, COVID, knock on wood, isn't super transmissible outside. And I think once it does become transmissible outside, like if it makes that leap, then there'll be more issues. But as of right now, I think... You know, they're kind of just making sure people don't gather at the finish line. So it's a completely different experience, but, you know, yeah. we can still race at least. Yeah. Just put the podium six feet apart, right? Like yeah. <laughs> first, second, and third, just a little bit That'd further be perfect. apart. Yeah. Less champagne all over you too, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what do you do for, like, uh, outside of running? Um, do you do any sort of certain strength and conditioning to help? with your running or how are you stretching out getting muscle recovery um like your muscles loosened up and stuff like that because i know just when i'm going into elk season and like i said i'm a bigger guy i don't train nearly as hard as you i'm sure i'm not (laughs) as limber and as agile as you but me just doing five miles and when i say a light jog there are times where i'm going uphill and i'm like fuck this i'm gonna walk right yeah for what sure. are you doing for strength and conditioning and to kind of stretch some of those muscles out just to help you recover faster um so i don't know if you train on a daily basis and i'm kind of asking two questions at once here but like yeah. how often do you train and how much recovery time do you take i feel like i'm all over the place so i try to run every day whether i get up in the morning makes a big difference because then you know you get up and it's 60 degrees out you can run way further enjoyably otherwise if I get stuck running later in the afternoon it's a little unfortunate but I still try to do it and so I generally try to mix yoga into it because yoga is I don't know it's good for my mind and my body and it keeps me a little bit more limber Um, but then I'll also try to do like a lot of ab exercises Something fun that we've been doing for teleworking because there's a couple of us in the same apartment right now. We were doing like a push-up challenge. What is teleworking? Is that where you're like working out together but like on Zoom or something? (laughs) No, like legitimately like my forester job I'm working on. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I got you. I got you. (laughs) So there's three, two to three of us like on and off teleworking from our apartment. And so we have this whiteboard and we had a push-up challenge. And so... We can just guilt each other and like you get a tally mark for every 10 push-ups. So I can do push-ups now. So I'm coming out of this on top. Like I couldn't (laughs) really do a lot of push-ups before. Um, And then we just like guilt each other if we don't do enough push-ups. So um, there aren't a lot of gyms where I live. So we were just kind of trying to maintain like simple at-home body workouts. I don't really have weights because I've moved so much lately that it would be really expensive to move 
Yeah, it's a pain in the ass to move weights for sure. Yeah, but one day I would love like a nice kettlebell or something. Oh, kettlebells <laughs> yeah. are awesome. Um, I've k- kicked myself in the ass because right before this, uh, I was looking at buying a full set of kettlebells, like everything from eight pounders, like all the way up to like 85 pounders, right? And I got super into kettlebell workouts just because they tend to be easier on my body than just regular lifting. Right. Um, and for jujitsu, it's the perfect thing. Like there's a there's a ton of moves and stuff that you do in jujitsu that kind of mimic kettlebell stuff, or the kettlebell stuff makes you more agile and and faster at it. Like um, there's certain things you can do with a kettlebell, like that are integrated into the jujitsu workout. And kind of where I fell into it was going to class, and they would make us do shrimps with a kettlebell, like a 45 shrimps. kettlebell. So it's where you lay on your back. And, um, you basically are scooting on your back by, you reach down to your ankles. Like this is a horrible, (laughs) but you (laughs) reach down to your ankles. Like you're going to pull up, like you're pulling pants on, but you're laying on your back and you have to scoot across the mat all the way. Yeah. Carla's all over it. She's going to find us a video or something here. So it works your abs, it works your legs, it works your neck, it works your back. And uh, in jiu-jitsu, you spend a lot of time on your back or on top of somebody. So if you're in the down position, it's a good way to get out of a sticky situation is to gotcha. shrimp out of it. And it's called the shrimp. But, okay, cool. Because you look like a shrimp going across the mat. <laughs> <laughs> and then they have all these other crazy things like gorillas and alligators and oh, all this good. different stuff that, that you kind of do um, just to help with that specific sport. But uh, – so that's kind of where I was going with, like, for strength and conditioning, is there anything that you do to strengthen your legs? Are you doing squats? Are you doing deadlifts to help your lower back and your core? Yeah, so it's mostly <clears throat> just body workouts. Like, I do try to do squats, and, you know, mostly I work on my core. I should probably, you know, give my legs a little more attention and do more things like that. So I'm working on it. Yeah. The other part is, like, just trying to get enough mileage in on top of top of working a full-time job is tough especially if you have friends and family you want to hang out with and they don't want to run with you right so that's what I've been dealing with this summer but I've been trying to kind of let go a little bit so like we just did a week and a half in the boundary waters so I'm just looking at that as like cross training so where's that at it's up in um, northern Minnesota by the Canadian border and it's amazing so we're just like canoeing all day we're doing like 11 mile days pretty frequently so it's a fun way to mix it up instead of just running all the time. It's a good core workout and an arm workout. And so yeah. you can't forget the arms. Can't Have you ever gone into a uh, stand-up paddle at all? No, I would love to, but they're expensive. Oh, you should totally do it. That's Because it's to. just that same sort of element, but you're standing. Yeah. So there's a lot more, especially if you get, uh, well, there's the lazy boards and then there's like the workout board. So if you buy a board that's too small, and for you it would be a hard thing <laughs> to find <laughs> right because what do you weigh 110 pounds 120 120 Very okay <laughs> yeah so i mean for me as a 280 pound guy <laughs> <laughs> to find a board that's that doesn't float you as well it's definitely a lot more of a workout because the whole time i'm oh, like shit yeah. i'm just trying to stay <laughs> up and like you really have to keep the paddle in the water to to stay up on a lot of these boards especially if it's a surfboard and that's kind of where i fell into it was living in southern california for the the time that i did um had some friends get me into stand up paddle surfing and it was awesome, but it's great cause it translates here too. So I can oh, still do sure. it here and get on the water, Yeah. but it, it's, it's a relaxing workout and it's one of those things. And I think one reason why I like to train jujitsu or striking like Muay Thai or boxing is you don't really know, you don't really, I guess you don't really realize mentally the output or what your body's going through and the workout that you're actually getting. Yeah. And I feel like paddle boarding is kind of the same way. Like you're having fun, like you want to keep up with people and, I could see but that. you're standing on it. It's awesome. You should definitely give it a try. I think now that I'm thinking about it, I tried once in South Padre <clears throat> and I remember I, I never fell because I was like, holy shit, like the jetties are right here. Like I know how many sharks are in this water. Oh yeah. <laughs> so it was like more motivation. And then like a couple hours later, you're like, oh, I went a few miles. Like that was good. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as far as, um, 
like recovery goes, uh, do you use any sort of supplements like uh, CBD? We're sponsored by Pure Spectrum. Um, they're awesome for athletes and uh, just an incredible company. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, you know, and they're a THC-free product. Not to make this sound like a commercial, <laughs> but they're, I th- believe, and Carla can comment on this, um, but I believe that they're the only CBD company that's sanctioned by the Olympic Athletic Commission as oh, well. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I love, I have like a salve of CBD that I use on my legs when they get super sore, and I feel like it's been huge. And um, there's actually like a tablet that has CBD, but it also has turmeric, um, MSM, chondritin, and all those things in that. So I take that once in a while too. Yeah. I feel it's super helpful. Uh, But then the other reason, like being in Pagosa Springs is awesome is because we have hot springs everywhere. Oh, right. Yeah. And so I'm working with uh, the Springs Resort in town and they have like 24 pools or something like that. And so, you know, you can literally go for a run and then go soak. And I feel like that heat is huge in recovery too, kind of reducing inflammation and they sure. have lots of like sulfide, um, sulfur and different types of salts and minerals in the water that are aiding to that recovery too. Yeah, no, that's a big thing here. And that's one of the great things about living in Colorado is there's so many spots, like almost anywhere that you live in Colorado, you're probably about an hour drive from any sort of hot spring. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. kind of cool. Yeah. There's, cool. they're all over the place. And, uh, <clears throat> In Pagosa is what that's kind of like the main tourist attraction in Pagosa, right? Is the hot springs there? Or? It depends what time of year it is. Cause yeah. In winter, we get all the skiers and snowboarders that go up to Wolf Creek. Right. And then you have tubing season, which is awesome. I love tubing. We like bought these twenty dollars used tubes and yeah. you just tube down the river. It's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Do you, you snow have, tube at all? Not yet, but we're okay. gonna try it. Oh uh, yeah. I think they'll be multi-purpose. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm pumped about that. Yeah. And then there's like rafting season, and then I think people just go to the hot springs all the time. Like after people skiing. come to just look at the leaves in the fall, right? Oh yeah, like the, you guys the have some peepers. huge aspen trees down there. And yeah. Some of those spots, like in Rifle, there's some huge aspen trees, and we uh, and Carla were actually just looking at a post of you standing next to this aspen tree, and it's like huge. There's no way you could wrap your arms around no, it. No, yeah. I have never seen anything me. that big, and I, I gotta ask it. you where this was. So let's see. <clears throat> This is on Forest Service. There's a trail that goes up to Opal Lake, and it's a relatively short. It's like two and a half miles, I think, up there. But they have these old growth aspen, which are awesome. Uh, someone once told me that is fucking incredible. That yeah. thing is huge. And so normally they have that really soft bark, uh, but then once they get older, they start getting those ridges and furrows, and they get thicker. And I think it might be because of either fire or snow. It might make them a little more adapted. Sure. Um, but I know fact, the animals eat the shit out yeah. of them too. And yeah, that, they like, kind of the like self-medicate. Go. Yeah. So their aspen is in the family with salicylic acid in their bark. So it's kind of like they're self-medicating, which is cool. I guess we could go out there and chew on them if you have like a toothache. No, you can't. I think the Native Americans, and I've done it before when I'm like, if I have a headache or something, and I don't know that the shit works or not. But Oh, there's the hat. Oh, awesome. It says Ren Steve get high. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't read it though, but... <laughs> Yeah, that well, there's a glare, oh, cool. but it's there, anyways. <laughs> but if you rub your hands on an aspen tree, it just get you get this white powder, right? Yeah. And I could be totally wrong, and this is something that Carla, you may need to look up. But I believe aspirin is made from aspen tree bark, isn't it? It actually, I went to Natural Grocers to buy some ibuprofen, which of course they don't have, and I bought uh-huh. willow bark. So willows oh, okay. and aspen are in the same family in cotton. As woods. aspirin. Yeah. Like the, oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So they have that. I think it's it's the salicylic acid that's in aspirin. Okay. I think. I huh. Have to fact check. But me I've been told, or the Native Americans, like if they had pain or issues or whatever, they would just rub their hand on the bark. I read it in some book, and I can't remember what it was. But then, you yeah. would just lick your hand, and that's smart. Yeah. You know what was up? You would get like basically a pill's worth of aspirin. I guess you <laughs> know what I mean if you licked your whole hand. I, I that's don't know. cool. They yeah. also in uh, in the southwest Colorado area, if you're walking around, you'll see these ponderosa pine, which just like as high as you can reach, just like thick bark pulled off. And so what they would do is they would um, peel back the bark and the sap and the trees is sugary and sweet. And they would eat that as like a snack. But they were smart enough to know 
if you did it around the entire tree that you would girdle the tree and kill it so there's just like right they're like historical um artifacts kind of now so these trees are federally protected and there's just like a huge chunk of missing bark from them that's crazy yeah they're smart so you're super close to like mesa verde national park have you done anything down there do you run down there or anything i went there last weekend we were coming back from mexican hat on a rafting trip and we stopped and we didn't realize like oh there's a 20 mile drive to get to all the cliff dwellings and things so we didn't get to stay there for very long but we just got to check it out that's super cool i want to go back i haven't been back i think as i went as a kid growing up in colorado that was like one of the i I don't know if it was i don't think it was a summer camp i think it was an actual like school camp where they took us out of school for four days and we got on a school bus and rode down there and stayed in these lodges and got in all kinds of fucking trouble sneaking out (laughs) at night and drinking beer and whatever else but it was so cool to see the cliff dwellings and that's something that I'm super intrigued in is just native American culture and yeah. all the different tribes and the different ways that they lived. And just, I just think about, uh, you know, just being a hunter gatherer in that time yeah. must've been so rewarding just to not have like your social media page that you were worried about or a mortgage or like right. all the stuff you were just worried about eat, sleep, and have fun, right? Right. <laughs> I mean, but then at the same time, it's like, oh, shoot, I missed that deer. Yeah, exactly. Can't just we run might starve. Yeah. yeah. That was cool. When we were in Mexican Hat, there's just tons of petroglyphs all over. And really? so we spent some time checking those out, too. And then um, a couple of days later, did Mesa Verde. So we just got to see like a ton of awesome artifacts. It was pretty That's great. really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely recommend going into some of those quick cliff dwellings and i think that you could turn it into a training session too at the same oh, time sure, right? you know like because there's uh, some of those are pretty good hike in and out yeah. of those you know like you're going into like the bottom of a canyon you know because it's very it's like a miniature grand canyon in there right there's yeah, like some crazy awesome. cliffs and stuff like that so. and i think it said that there were six thousand different cliff dwellings so wow yeah it would keep you busy for quite a while yeah <laughs> for sure um, so what do you do for training in the winter? Because uh, like to run an ultra in the winter is not, or to train ultra in the winter is probably not the easiest thing to do. Are you just running on roads or are you still getting out on the trail and fighting the snow or? Well, so that was my biggest concern. Cause before I moved to Pagosa in December, I was out in Canyon city where like, you don't get that much snow. Like you can go run on the trails forever. Sure. Um, so for a while, it's pretty cool in Pagosa. They have so much of the hot spring water that they use it to actually heat some of the sidewalks. Oh yeah. And then the city itself has this nice river walk that they maintain. So generally like I have these sweet Solomon shoes that are really good. Oh, for there's just you. Running. Is that Pagosa right That's there? That's me. That's the hot springs. Resort. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. I'm so spoiled. <laughs> that is really awesome. And then the San Juan river is in the back. So you can like, you can do, um, what do they call it? It's like, fancy cryotherapy or something like you can hop in the river and then go back into the hot springs so cold the hot cold cold shock yeah Yeah. (laughs) so it's super fun for sure um but so i have yak tracks too but they give you really good traction if you're running in snow but most of the time the sun's so hot there that it'll melt the snow and you can run on the sidewalk or some trails and so many people snowshoe which is fine um it's great because they pack down the trails for me so i can still run on some trails sure but the other thing i discovered is cross-country skiing there's oh, really? so many trails out there so you can just rent some skis and go out oh there you are right there carla's <laughs> She's all on over top of it yeah so yeah we've been able to do a lot of that and there's so much forest service out there there's so many oh, trails. that's so awesome yeah and, it's, and i guess it's that's similar. very similar motion to running right i yeah. mean kind of we tried cross country, which is similar. Like you just lift up your feet, the tops are attached. Uh-huh. And then we tried skate skiing, which I I'm not. Someone That's told where me you like. It's almost like, like you're ice skating, right? Yeah. Someone told me that like dancers are good at it, and I'm like, that makes sense. I'm not coordinated at all, so because sure. <laughs> you're like pushing <laughs> out and it's slippery, and like you're trying to move forward, and yeah. yeah. But it was super fun. I'm I not a good ice winter. skater, so I would imagine I'm not very good at that. I've snowshoed quite a bit because um, I used to do some backcountry snowboarding, and that was super fun to throw a snowboard on a backpack and then oh, hike sure. them out and then snowboard out was like yeah. the best thing, right? Like if your legs were that. completely toast. Right? I got to get into that too. Yeah, that was super <laughs> awesome. I mean, you got to be careful of avalanche stuff. I would definitely recommend doing some sort of entry-level avalanche right. That's thing what I've if heard you're going to do that, you know. But, uh, but yeah, it's uh, 
That's really fun. Is that your dog in the snow? Yeah, she's tolerant. <laughs> Is she buried she's or what? She's very patient with us, yeah. That's awesome. We made a little Java snowman, <laughs> snow lady. <laughs> She got awesome. treats when she was done. So, don't so does she go on every run with you or is she she's your training partner? Or? Generally, if it's cooler out, if it's hot out, like she'd overheat and she just attracts sun. So if right. it's in the morning, I'll usually take her and she loves it. And she she generally knows that she'll get brekkie when she gets back. So yeah. she likes to run with me. <laughs> and she made it to the Virgin Islands with me. Yeah. So I lived there for like six and a half months and she came with me. So she got to be a little island dog for a while. So you were working there, right? Like yeah. you, you got to go there and work and experience the Virgin Island. That not very many people get to do that. That's really awesome. Yeah, I don't know. How Can that we works dive out. into that? We're gonna get <laughs> off the of ultra a little bit. Yeah, for sure. And I want to know. Uh, I guess maybe before we get into this, if we could figure out a little bit about your background. Are you from Colorado, oh, gosh, or where yeah. you're from originally, and what brought you to Colorado? Kind of. Okay. Well, let's see. <laughs> I Is it a long story? <laughs> a little bit. I've been That's all, all right. over the place. So We got time. So I'm from Wisconsin. I'm from this like little town. This is Wisconsin, uh -huh. and that's where I'm from. Um, but anyways, right in the middle? Yeah, okay. it was like 1,200 people. And so I ended up getting my undergrad at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse in biology, where I ended up studying abroad in Belize for two weeks, which was awesome. And then I also studied abroad for six months in Australia. Wow. So student loans. Yeah. <laughs> but it was amazing. And then Australia. A specific type of biology or? Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist. So I was studying marine symbioses in Belize. And then that and kind of Australia, flora and ecology management. And so going back to running Australia is what got me into it so I think it was like 2021 20, when I went there and I was just like I don't have a vehicle I don't have a bike how do I see all this awesome stuff I'm a mile from the ocean like I gotta get there so I just started running I did my first 13 miler when I was in Australia and so it just kept going from there because I was like I'm running in these eucalypt so forests. that's what got you into yeah. long distance running yeah Australia just seeing the countryside yeah maybe Australia can sponsor me that's awesome <laughs> yeah the country of Australia yeah, it please. was amazing and then you just go <laughs> how for about ACDC Oh. <laughs> Shout out to yeah. ACDC, right? <laughs> Hit them up too. <laughs> We're looking for a sponsorship. Maybe they'll go yeah. for a run in Australia <laughs> <Yeah>. with me. <laughs> and so, like, literally, you just go for a run. You go hop in the ocean. It was amazing. And where were you at exactly in Australia? Newcastle. Okay. So, yeah. up the coast from Sydney a bit. Yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. I want to go back so bad. But. It's an incredible spot. I've spent a lot of time in Sydney and the Gulf Coast. Uh, the Gold Coast. Yeah, Sorry, we went Gulf up there Coast, too. <laughs> Gold Coast is awesome. Some of the shows that we did there were just like we used to do a festival there every year, and those beaches and those people are just so cool and laid. Oh, it's it's awesome. just laid back. It's good time. I love it. Like if I ended up not living in America, it would definitely be Australia. Yeah. So that's a good place. That's pretty crazy. That's yeah. a crazy place to run. I mean, I guess we have danger from predators here, but. To me, like a saltwater <laughs> croc or a tree oh, yeah. that can kill you or spiders. Crocodiles. They can sense your heartbeat underwater. Really? Isn't that terrifying? That is, I'm yeah. fascinated but terrified. Yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. That's crazy. Um, so let's see. Australia. I went back. Um, and then I did an internship in San Diego. I worked with Navy dolphins and sea oh. lions. So that was super fun. That's you know, cool. Throw that into the mix. Um, went back and graduated. And then I started grad school down at University of Texas in Brownsville. Uh -huh. um, and then I ended up transferring. So I lived in Sao Padre for eight months. It okay. Was, you know, That's not a bad spot school. either. Yeah. That's like the best. <laughs> well, I think Austin might be my favorite part of Texas, but the Padre Islands are pretty oh, cool. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. One of my best friends still lives there, Shelby. So we get to go visit her, and she's like this huntress. They hunt nail guy. Do you, have you ever heard of that? No. What is that? Oh, it's hard to spell um, nail guys. Is it a deer or it's something? It's invasive, and they're huge. It's like a horse, like a zebra with like a tiny head. They're just super invasive. They used to be down in ranches there, and pretty much like any they fence got you build won't yeah. keep them in. So wow. they're a huge issue. Yeah, you should try to Hey, Carla, can you look up a nail guy? Nail guy? Do you know like how to N -A, spell that? A, it's, I think they might be from India. It's like N-A nail I think I maybe have seen them at the zoo. They're like half zebra, half yeah. llama yeah, or something, right? Yeah, that's it. Aren't they goofy? What the hell? They're huge. They're like they're like bigger than an elk. They're just massive. And those are in South Padre, Texas. Yeah, they're all over. Well, maybe not specifically South Padre, uh -huh. but they're I think in Laguna Atascosa, which is right nearby. 
Really? And I think, I don't know if you have to put they're it in They're just for taking them over, huh? I think you just need like any sort of hunting license because they're amazing. Wow. Yeah, and they eat everything. That's pretty crazy. They're huge. But yeah. That's like the deer that they have in Lanai. I forget the name of the deer. Oh, access deer. Access deer, yeah. yeah. And I have a ton of friends that have went over there and hunted them and they're like, you should go and yeah um i would love to do that but, and they're super fast but there's no agile. predators to eat them so like yeah yeah and they're used to like running from lions so they're just super hard to get yeah yeah i you know uh hawaii has no snakes either i really? never knew that Are until sure? we started going well i don't know if they have <laughs> no snakes at all but i know for a fact um when i was doing rock tours and a couple times that we would ship gear over there they had this whole like snake uh, protocol oh, like eradication. where they had to go through everything that was in a package or in okay. like a crate or any sort of large freight, right? If it was being imported, which everything is imported on the island all, right, right down to milk, right? Yeah. Um, so they would have to go through it and they would just basically if there was a snake in it, they'd kill it. So they don't have snakes on the island, which is really good because like. It's crazy that an animal like that can just totally take over, like uh, like in the Everglades, for example. Like people oh, have gosh. these pet pythons and stuff, yeah. and they let them go. Or some crazy assholes have like saltwater crocodiles that oh, they've let go yeah. down there, and now that like now that's an issue. You know what I mean? Like that's totally insane because these snakes get like twenty feet. 30 feet, I don't know how big they get, but they get fucking huge. Oh, yeah. And the Game and Fish, uh, Florida Game and Fish actually puts, like, a bounty on them. And I have a, a friend of mine that goes down there, and he makes money just hunting snakes. <laughs> and he's been bitten by an alligator. He's been bitten really? by, like, an 18-foot python or some shit like that. I'm like, oh, my God, <laughs> dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, invasives are bad, I think, specifically in islands because they just flourish, and then they'll – target like migratory songbirds and things like that and so the natives are just screwed when you get like a top yeah. predator like that out there yeah it's kind of crazy i mean <clears throat> humans fuck up a lot of shit that's all i gotta say man. right <laughs> we're good there's at it there's not much more you can say about that but. <laughs> so sorry back to your background we kind of went off on a little tangent right there so oh, what ended so up bringing you to colorado was it your biology so, work? Or? We're almost there. Okay. So okay. Sal Padre transferred to Mississippi State, got a degree, a master's in forestry. And so then I was just applying for jobs in Mississippi, trying to hang out with my boyfriend. And if you go on uh, USA Jobs to apply for federal jobs, you can click like all these different locations. And I'm like, ooh, Wyoming, Colorado, fun. So eventually they offer me this job and I get to move out there. So I went from Kadasho, which is this made up government word that just means like the person who does the land surveying and puts up the boundaries. Okay. So I did that seasonal and then straight out of grad school, like it's so hard to find a permanent job. So I was taking everything I could find. So I worked for the BLM for six months and then I got a job as a park ranger for six months for the BLM. And then after that, I got the job in the Virgin Islands. So I was an urban and community forestry coordinator for like six and a half, seven months, but I missed the mountains. So I actually ended up moving back here for the VLM as a wildlife technician. Really? <laughs> and then finally I got my so first what is, permanent job. Sorry, what is a wildlife technician? Amazing. Is that, is that a game <laughs> and fish? Um, so the BLM actually ironically gets funding from oil and gas to kind of do this wildlife program they have other funding too but mm -hmm. that's actually what my boyfriend does right now he's a wildlife biotechnician and so they do different projects so depending on you know if the forester is going to do a logging project they have to go clear that area and make sure there are no raptor nests so that's just mm. one thing we do um, you can literally i got paid to go walk around public lands looking for raptors it was awesome that's great and then if you find a nest they create a buffer so that they won't disturb the nest um and then another thing we would so basically they're not taking their habitat away or you're not relocating them yeah you're just saying hey this Protecting it. this area right here you cannot log yeah because some of these nests that we are tracking are from the 70s so it, even wow. if it's not those same birds it's other birds other species will reuse those nests and rebuild them so that was really awesome. That's cool. Yeah. And um, we did different things like the Mexican spotted owl is out there. So we would go hike into these really steep, narrow canyons when it's starting to get dark out. Then you wait for it to get dark. <laughs> and then you 
you call owls and then hopefully they're there and you can track them and see where they're living and to protect them. And then in the dark, you hike out, which yeah. is interesting. Almost. Yeah. There's a lot of people and you don't really realize it until you're, you know, five miles deep in a wilderness area yeah. that are afraid of the dark. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun time to, yeah. I'm a little afraid of the dark. But oh, I'm there getting, you are in I'm the dark better. right there. Yeah. That was right before I got dude on. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and those are the Salomon shoes. They have like, oh, I have them on my feet right now, but they have yeah. like these awesome, like, they're like better than. Oh, chats. sweet. Yeah. So they would do really good in like heavy trails, snow. Whatever. What kind of shoes are those? Salomon. Okay. I love them. Yeah. Do you, are you endorsed by them or? No. Okay. So this isn't a commercial. <laughs> no. But Salomon, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought like my third pair of them. Yeah. But anyways. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so being a biologist, um, God, what a cool career. I mean, how hard is it to find a job? Because I know like when I was, I don't know, 18 or 19, I was like, okay, maybe not 18 or 19. I might've been a little bit younger than that, but I was like, I want to get a job in forestry. And I totally got discouraged by this old forestry guy because it was so competitive and trying to get a job. And I think being a female helps. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a male-dominated field, so I'm sure it helps if they're like, oh, we have a female forester. Yeah. So it probably worked in my favor. Sure. Um, but. And gosh. what do you do now for the Forest Service? So now I'm a forester. I'm kind of funded by the American Forest Foundation. Okay. So it kind of allows me to do outreach to landowners and then they have the option I can go out there and do an initial site visit and kind of teach them about their specific forests and then if they want I'll come back and I'll do a forest inventory kind of tell them the health of their forests look for different um, indicators of disease or just you know overall species so are you looking for like beetle kill and uh yeah so just different like uh not enough groundwater um, oh, look at you there. <laughs> yeah, that's a Doug fir. Oh, my. That is a huge tree. You can tell what it is. By is that in Colorado? Is. Yeah, it is. Wow. And those are a different color of the same shoes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love them. But <laughs> yeah, that's a huge Doug fir, and there's some really big ones out there still. So wow. That makes me happy. That's awesome. Have you ever spent any time in the Sequoias? Yes. Yeah, I went isn't to that Sequoia awesome? National Park once. And oh, it was my God. Amazing. I got to take my kids there. It's, it really puts it in perspective how small and minuscule a human life can be sometimes oh, it's like sure. like seeing a gray whale in the ocean oh when goodness. you're just on your paddleboard or something like that oh, or sure. or a shark or you know a large shark or something like that oh, really yeah. puts it in perspective a grizzly shark. you're just yeah. like I, I can't do anything please don't eat me oh <laughs> humans are so out of their element <laughs> it's it's amazing that we survived honestly because there's I mean, we're just like, we're not very fast. <laughs> nope. <laughs> we're su- it's our brains. We're super smart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sometimes. Something some like people. that. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes too smart. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing how, how much you're out of your element when it comes to like actually running in a forest or oh, yeah. uh, if you're not on a trail or something like I'm that, right? I'm just like, well, hopefully the mountain lions are full because there's so many deer here. Right. And they don't want to <laughs> eat me, you know? So yeah. I hope. Do you carry anything with you for protection when it comes to that? Like, It depends, like, on the distance. Sometimes I'll carry bear spray, which I think I'm probably more of a threat to me at that point. Like, I'm accidentally going to, like, drop it or, like, spray myself. Sure. But, yeah, sometimes. Oh, yeah, that's me. That's a, oh, that's again. you with a gun. Yeah. Is that you scuba diving, too? Yeah. Or, okay, awesome. <laughs> you just kind of do it all, don't you? If the opportunity presents itself. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. But, yeah, uh... Actually, I, we were, when I had uh, the other ultra marathon guy on, Jay, um, we were talking about, m- we went on a mountain lion tangent and mountain lion attacks and how often we come across like sign of a mountain lion, whether it's a uh, buried animal or scat or mostly tracks is what I, what I see after a snowstorm. Oh, yeah. But other than that, it's very, very rare that you see a lion, right? Like, oh, yeah. They I don't probably know how see many, us all the time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, we were talking about that, and it kind of came up in conversation. And I guess that there were some wildlife officers or something that were in Montana. And I, I don't know the whole story. I'm probably going to screw this up. But they were 
I think they were servicing or tagging another animal or something like that, and they got attacked by a mountain lion oh. in the process, and they started using their bear spray, and it mm. was enough to deter the lion. So well, that's it's good, good to know it works. But in yeah. a windy situation right. or something like that, yeah. bear spray is not going to do that much. No. Yeah. I just hope that they're full because there's a lot of times like <laughs> I'll be running and I'll be like, oh, do, 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 like this is beautiful. Sure. And all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, there's some bones right there and it looks kind of fresh. So then I'll kind of run faster. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. And then I'll be like, well, they're clearly full if they just ate that deer, hopefully. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, you definitely got to keep your head on a swivel. And if you do get attacked by one, you're supposed to fight back. Right. If you encounter one on. If, if they're actually yeah. on you, as right? As long as they're not, like, rabid, and yeah. then I'll, it's all out the door. Like, who knows what you're supposed to do. But exactly. I think, yeah, because at the same time, you know, they're, they're a predator, they're a top predator. Like, them being able to hunt and feed themselves is their livelihood. So if they realize they're attacking something that has a, a fighting chance, they're going to realize that it's not safe and try sure. to get out of there, hopefully. You, know. you should get a fixed blade knife or something, like, oh, you like get something little badass like that. Yeah. Like you, the, you pop it. No, it. just like a, a <laughs> knife that has a handle that you don't actually have to fold. You can just pull it out of something. Oh, yeah. Like, because at be least good. if it was on your back, you could. And it's not like you're carrying a gun into the woods, right? Like yeah. it's legal to carry. I mean, yeah. And if you get in a survival situation, something like that. Um, right. Safety. But yeah, you should definitely grab something like yeah. that. And it, they're lightweight and easy to carry. But yeah. I have my little pity. Yeah. I don't know. Well, right. that definitely helps having a dog with you because that might actually just warn you that something else is oh, in yeah. the area. And a lot of times, I mean, God forbid, but like I've been in a situation growing up as a kid and it was just coyotes. Um, and I don't think that they were trying to attack me, but they were trying to. Right. You never know. How yeah. They are. I mean, you never know. I, I, I don't think that. I think you'd have to be a small child or something. But having a dog is just sets off. They have yeah, such a better sense of awareness, right, when it comes to that sort of thing where their hair starts to stand up yeah. or, or they'll bark if they see something or hear something. Um, <clears throat> so I think that that really does. And honestly, they're going to help you fight back. Most dogs are not, you know, they protect their owners. That's I the hope best so. Thing. I hope she That's does. why they're man's best friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> she did, actually. I was out on a trail, and she was, like, staring at something. And I'm like, what are you looking at? And I saw a little bear. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Like, I think the bear was running away anyways. I feel like most black bears are usually pretty timid, but yeah, you never know. You get that one that's all riled up or yeah, something. Yeah, and uh, there's actually more black bear attacks like in states like Montana than there is actually grizzly attacks. Really? Just the grizzly attacks are fatal Yeah. more more times than not. But uh, Yeah, the last grizzly was actually around the Pogosa area. Really? And then we have the Wemenuch Wilderness. So they know that there's a grizzly in Colorado because I know that- They uh, know? Well, I know that there was a famous hunter, and I can't remember his name. Um, Carla, maybe that's something you could look up. Just see if there's grizzly sightings in Colorado. I know that they had it on film, and it was in the Santa Ana Cristo Mountains oh, mountain range. Gotcha. Um, that they spotted a grizzly in there. Oh, really? And I know that their migration pattern used to be from, like, Canada all the way down to Mexico. Oof. Along the Rockies, you know, so... Yeah. But. They're tough. Who knows? Yikes. <laughs> so do you still do a lot with wildlife when you're talking to these land um, owners or something yeah, like that? I, or they? I try to. It's funny because you get like the full spectrum of people. You get the people sure. who are like, I don't want any wildlife. They just, you know, eat everything. Or you get the people <laughs> who want to promote it. So I try to be that happy medium. And then, like, when I am walking through a forest, I try to find, like, any raptor nests or things like that so that we can put a buffer and protect them at least. So Sure. Yeah, I try to give them some education and depending on how much they want to know. Yeah. What do you think about the wolf integration oh, they're boy. talking about? Yeah. That's super interesting. I feel like if the wolves want to come back, they hopefully could. But I know ranchers aren't a super fan of it because of the Elk hunters aren't and, either. Yeah. So I don't know if us, I feel like, you know, sometimes we're trying to play God a little too much, like putting animals yeah. where we think they should go. And then, you know, it's tough. I've heard landowners actually tell me they thought they saw wolves. So I'm curious. Well, actually, I saw a spike in it from um, 
COVID-19, they were saying there's more people using the outdoors, right? Yeah. And this is actually from Colorado Division of Wildlife, that they've had more reported wolf sightings since March really? than they've had in like 15 years or oh, something. Cool. Just because people are out. So they're here. And I, I know that their migration patterns are huge. Like they, I think an alpha male can do like 300 miles in a day. Oh, over awesome. glaciated peaks. I mean, that's in like that's Montana and stuff. So that's pretty in, that's a long range. And I think that that's probably if they're looking for a pack or something like that. I think once they're in a pack, they stay pretty exclusive, gotcha. but I don't know. I'm hopefully I'm working right now to get some wolf experts in here because that's something I'm super passionate about. Yeah, and, I'd love uh, to hear what they have to say. Yeah, I want to know what they want to say. And I also want, I want to hear both sides of the fence. But I was curious to, as you as a biologist and the line of work that you're in, I know that sometimes you guys can't comment on some of that, those sort of issues. But I was curious what your stance was I on mean, it. I mean, I think they're pretty cool. Like, we have wolves in Wisconsin, and people get them on their game cams. And Do they? I don't know. I mean, it would suck if we. Do you think they're coming in from Canada, or they've been reintroduced? Do you know? Or? I don't really know because there's wolves in Yellowstone, but then there's like different species of wolves. Right. So that would all be super interesting to know. Yeah. I mean, I can't wait to get a wolf expert in here. Yeah. And, uh, that'd be cool. I've been talking to a couple of them. It's just been scheduling. So, but we're okay. definitely going to get them in here before November. Oh, awesome! So, I just think that it's kind of crazy that it's left up to voters too. Yeah, and it's, it's not like, like the why wouldn't it be are... left up to biologists and yeah. landowners, you it know, is, or something like that? And uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's and just then, like because know. somebody thinks a wolf is cool, they're gonna vote. Yeah, and then to have them here, you know, there's like, so many people moving to Colorado, and so many people like being introduced to the outdoors and recreating. That same voter is gonna run into a wolf, and then what? <laughs> you know, like exactly. You know. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a sticky situation, and I can't really get into it too much on. I don't want to get into it too much on here without knowing all the facts. But I have my own feelings about it. But uh, but yeah, we'll see where it goes. I mean, it's going to be up to voters at that point. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, you also one thing that I think is super cool about on top of everything that we've already talked about. You have your own nonprofit, right? Yeah. Or you it's a you're a co founder or something? Yeah, of a me non-profit? and my boyfriend we founded Conservation, which is a legitimate five oh one C three nonprofit. Awesome. Yeah, and, and so what do you guys do exactly? We our main focus is trying to get people outdoors and kind of trying to build that connection with nature so that they too want to protect it. And so something that we've really done is ecological restorations. Uh, we've done a couple and then also things like beach cleanups are pretty easy so I had a couple events when I was in the Virgin Islands because the ocean's there and they still use plastic and so it was good to kind of have different areas that we've been able to focus on and our first event was in Mississippi there's this um, black prairie and it's a remnant prairie and so it's this hot spot of just nutrients in the middle of the south and there's all of these remnant prairie plants and they're just getting divided because these juniper are encroaching and they have this long tap root so they just suck up all the water and outcompete everything so on earth day we actually cut the juniper so we're cutting trees on earth day a little counterintuitive but right and so we try to do events like that and get people more involved and get them is to get that our not a dirty. native plant there or something or is um that? so it is but not in the prairies oh and so okay. that forest that juniper type is encroaching in those native prairies like the remnants of them it used to be a huge crescent shape and then the prairies just started encroaching. And so that's the other thing is like, what's native? What, you know, things are all sure. changing. Do we keep what once was or do we try to modify it to what we think is going to be? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that that's kind of the sticky situation with wolves, too. I mean, some people say that they aren't native to Colorado, like right. that they were never in this range. But I don't know. Yeah. And yeah. I'm not an expert. So, you know, I'm just trying to. Yeah, nor am go, I. Go along with it and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so with your nonprofit, where could somebody find you guys if they want to learn more about it or if they want to help with it or yeah, maybe even sure. donate? So it's just conservation. So it's conservation with a van. <laughs> so okay. there's just an extra N in there and it's .org. And that's because you and your boyfriend oh, are yeah, the most van owners, part. right? Yeah. yeah. So it's like our VW. We have an 83 VW van. It's like our mascot. Yeah. 
And so, um, let's see, it's not on there. It's up on top. You can't see it. But okay. yeah, we have an 83 VW van. And so we were kind of driving to places and trying to do these events. And um, actually, when I was in the Virgin Islands, Jordan had gone out to Utah and he was picking up trash at these national parks because that was during the f- government furlough and everything shut down. And so our national parks were just filling up with trash. People were still going there. And I think the local Colorado News actually covered it. Granted, they got it wrong. They said me and Java were there and we were in the right. Virgin <laughs> Islands. But um, yeah, it was awesome. And then there was a, a Utah news company that went to one of those national parks and they're like, look, there's no trash. And it's because he was there literally the day before and oh picked up God. the trash. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool. We're kind of all over. We try to just, you know, get people outdoors and yeah, that's great. That's awesome. I think that that's the biggest part of it. And I think, I feel like people don't purposely just go out there and throw their trash on the ground. Or maybe if they do, maybe it's a cultural indifference, right? Like, or, yeah, or something and like, and I don't want to speculate on litter, right? But yeah, it could be something as simple as no one was like, hey, if you throw this out the window, it's not just going to degrade. Right. You know, that would take like a hundred years for that to degrade. Maybe sure. they just, no one ever told them that. Or maybe it's literally just out of sight, out of mind, you know. For me, too, I spend a lot of times in the river. I'm a fly fisherman and uh, like to fish. My kids love to fish. And uh, just even fishing tackle can be, I consider it litter, you know. Like I see so many people, like fishing line's a big deal, right? And I run into it all the time. It's in the trees. It's in, you know, everywhere. (laughs) Java's going crazy over here. (laughs) She's fine. She's fine. Uh, But yeah, it's uh, that's kind of crazy that like some of these fishing line manufacturers, you know, it's basically that fishing line has got a hundred year lifespan on it. Oh, no. For it to actually, you know, bite a great. Yeah. And then it Uh, gets wrapped around. Yeah. Animals, animals, all kinds of different stuff. It's just not good. Not great. And then not to mention on top of that, you have fish hooks, you got lures, you got worm containers, you got all this stuff. So literally half the time I spend in the river, I pack a bag in my fishing, like I have a little fishing backpack. I pack like a trash bag in there. She's totally fine. Just let her go. Yeah, (laughs) it's all right. We needed a new one anyways. It's too small for my dog. Um, For people that are listening, she's tearing up a dog bed right now. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, but yeah, it's. It's crazy just the amount of trash that can come from something like that. You know what I mean? Oh, and for sure. I think, uh, I think, you know, like the Forest Service and Game of Fish could do some better jobs in their publications. Like, hey, you know, let's be a little bit more vigilant. Maybe we, you know, in those high traffic areas or, or f- heavily fished areas, maybe we put up a few signs or something that right. say, please, you know, take all your fishing tackles, consider trash yeah. or whatever it is, right? And Social media is an easy places. way to get the message out these days, right? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And then I saw some places that started to do like a PVC pipe. So if you actually pick up your own or someone else's fishing line, you can dispose of it instead of it just blowing away. Oh, really? Blowing That's away. awesome. Yeah. So maybe more things like that. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's easy. it's easy to do. And then that way, I think that that's probably the biggest thing is just educating people on, on how to use it and be good stewards of public land. And I think talking to people like you that have, you know, a passion behind it, you actually have a foundation that helps that's helping with that. Right. (laughs) Um, you're a biologist on top of that. You spend a ton of time outside. What are some more things that you see, um, as human beings that we can be doing better to help preserve public lands? So when my kids get to be my age, their kids can, go fishing and, uh, you know, use some of the same trails that we did and stuff like that. Oh goodness. I think something that's huge is when I was a park ranger, I did some trail work and it's some of the hardest work I've ever done. So literally like if you can go volunteer for a day and a local trail that's being built, you kind of learn all of the hard work that goes into it and maintaining it. And it kind of makes you appreciate it more. So I think, you know, these trails go for miles, right? Yeah. And we're so lucky. Like Wisconsin has no public lands. Like Colorado, we are so lucky. We have Forest Service. We have National Park Service. We have BLM. Like we have so many trails and so much access to these lands that we can use. Like we don't have to be a landowner and own 40 acres. We can just go out there and access it. 
I think that's huge and kind of just doing little things to educate yourself or leave no trace has some principles I think just kind of learning about those things will make you kind of a better land user yourself because you realize you're protecting it you're part of it it's all part of a bigger picture because you're like oh well you know, if I dropped this one piece of garbage, it was just me dropping this one piece. But then you think of the thousands of people that use our public lands every day, you know, and if that just keeps adding up and accumulating, then you start having all the issues. So, yeah, I think not to mention huge. animals eat that that yeah. messes with their digestive system, that sort of thing. You know, there's a ton of different things that it affects. It's not just having the litter on the ground. And for me, I was always taught that public land was just as much mine as it is yours or the, anybody that's using it, right? Mm -hmm. And I was taught to treat it like it was your own. And yeah. it really it is because you're huge. paying for it, right? I mean, if you're a caller, if you live in Colorado or anywhere along the Rocky Mountain region or anywhere in the U.S. that has public land or national parks, it's basically your land. I mean, you should treat it right. like your home, right? Oh, 100%. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I think that that's a big misconception, too, is just treat it like it's yours, you know, and, and yeah. think about your kids using it and their kids using it, you know, your grandchildren, future generations. Because um, I feel like if we don't take care of it, it's not going to be here much longer. Right. <laughs> and yeah. then another huge thing I've seen is just like pay attention to fire bans because you don't want to be yeah. that one asshole who starts a fire because you're smoking a cigarette during a stage one fire ban, you know, just exactly. little things like that. Or just make sure like if you can't have a fire, don't have one charcoal fires like you don't want to be that one person who starts that wildfire that just destroys so much land. So. Yeah. And that really rips through it. And it's a problem here every year. And it's a problem across the U.S. every year. I mean, even down in Florida, right, where they have abundance of water, they still get wildland fires. Yeah, just down things there. are crazy right now everywhere. Yeah. But. Yeah, that's huge. Well, I really appreciate you coming in, and I think that we covered a ton of stuff, and I feel like we could keep going, but we're coming <laughs> up on our hour and a half, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Oh, but no uh I, we'd love me. to have you back eventually you know if you're willing to come back and uh had a great time sitting down and talking to you and i feel like there's a ton of issues and other ways that we can help people and i want to help you with your um nonprofit as well Thank you. Conf, <laughs> cons conservation yeah. okay all right <laughs> so if there's anything that we can do for you guys in the future if we need to help spread a message or you guys got events coming up or something, please let oh, us know. Awesome. Thank but you. But before we jump off the air with you, um, you want to tell people where they can find you. You have an Instagram, you have websites, you got all kinds of different stuff. <laughs> I'm all um, over the place. <laughs> yeah. And take as long as you need to tell us where. Yeah. So where. it's super simple. I mean, it's just Science Sadies, and I guess Sadies is C E D E S. That'd okay. be difficult. But I think yeah. it's just that all around Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. Awesome. So. Cool. And then uh, the website, if you want to drop that again yeah. real quick for your... So it's uh, just www.conservation.org. So it's conservation with a van. Okay. Perfect. So not too hard. Awesome. Yeah. And then what's your next event that you have coming up? Are you running a race or are you oh going to be... Do you so know yet? I'm hoping in September that I'll be doing... Um, the American Berkey 100K. Okay. And so we'll see. Hopefully it doesn't get canceled, but I'm hoping to run that. Well, cool. Shoot yeah. me a text or something before you do it, and we'll be oh, cheering for, sure. for you on yeah. that. And then what about for your foundation? Do you guys have any events coming up where people could come and help out or be a part of it? Do you have anything scheduled right now? I know it's a difficult time. So. Yeah, so we'll be working on it. We moved to Bogosa in December, so we're kind of trying to establish what needs what what, what needs work, um, a volunteer group. So we'll definitely be getting on that soon. And awesome. then hopefully COVID will kind of, we'll figure that out so that we can have events and not be spreading germs. Right. Yeah. So. It's kind of a slippery slope right now, but sure. I'm sure we'll get back to normal at some point. I think we've been through yeah. a bunch of these and we're getting there <laughs> previous years. Yeah. I think we're trying to figure it out at least. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again so much for your time. And yeah. uh, it's been a pleasure sitting down and talking to you. 
Carla, you still alive back there? Hey, I'm alive, and I wanted to end on one um, interesting note. Yeah. So women are actually outperforming men at long distances, starting Ooh. at 195 miles is when oh, no. females <laughs> become faster than, than males in, in ultra marathons. Wow. So go us. So I got to do a 200. <laughs> All right. you go gotta, women. You got to go 200. <laughs> awesome. Man, those are gnarly. I can't – shout out to all those people that run those 200 mile races. Yeah. And, all that crazy shit like that, and uh, it's not for me. <laughs> I'm glad there's people like you that are out there doing it. So, all right, awesome. thank you again so much, yeah, Mercedes, for and, uh, me and we'll Donna. stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely, it's awesome. <laughs> first female, first dog, first female dog. Yeah, yeah, first female dog. There you go. <laughs> all right, have a good day, everybody. Thank you.